Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good day. This is uh, Gary Sikich. I'm a principal with Logical Management Systems. And today's webinar, we're going to talk about the role of corporate leadership in educating employees to risk management and resiliency. Um, in order to give you a little bit of a background, I will explain my, my background and experience. I've been doing risk management, crisis management, uh, infrastructure protection in all aspects of planning and wargaming exercising for a, a long time, over 28 years. Uh, I've authored four books. Uh, on the screen, you'll see that there's five. One of the books has been translated into Spanish. Uh, generally, th these are available on Amazon, Albris, uh, Barnes & Noble, etc. The latest book was Protecting Your Business in a Pandemic, which uh, focuses on not so much the medical aspects, but on how to protect your business if your business is affected uh, by employee uh, absences, et cetera, and demands and whatnot. Um, the next uh, slide we'll talk about is the uh, this aspect of the role of corporate leadership. I think this is important for us to understand um, simply because when you begin to look at leadership, uh, in an organization, how do they communicate risk management and this issue of what we call resiliency to the general organization so that everyone has a common understanding and that when we move through the various aspects of dealing with identification of risk, mitigating risk, etc., we all understand the uh, focus as to how the organization should respond. So it really begins to get to look at uh, a broad-based issue in this regard. Uh, when we look at corporate leadership, there's some things we need to look at here. One, we want to build a, 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 an atmosphere of teamwork, and then team leadership, which is, if you look at the slides, is defined by the team leader, the person who is appointed, elected, or informally chosen to direct and coordinate the work of others in a group. Uh, this leads us to a really interesting perspective because leadership is a challenge in a lot of ways for organizations to have good leadership that works hand in hand, in hand with uh, the rest of the organization. And this requires us to have a change in terms of awareness so that individuals uh, become more aware situationally of what's going on in terms of their uh, their work, the kind of risks and threats that we face, and some of the need for communication on these issues. Uh, when we look at this, you get into decision-making issues. We get into the looking at how do we deal with stress in the workplace, fatigue as we run into uh, crisis situations for with long hours, uh, prolonged work times, etc., and then the general work environment that we're faced with, which causes us to begin to start to look at uh, a broader-based issue from a management perspective and corporate leadership is to health of the organization and the welfare of the people that are involved in the organization. So if we look at the key points or key concepts in building an effective team organizationally, some of the things we want to look at are, are, are as follows. Uh, one, you have to recognize a team is an intelligent entity. Okay, they're, 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 People are, are not just uh, put assigned to a team without some thought process. And those people are intelligent people, regardless of the level they are in the organization. The way the team thinks is going to be different from how individuals think. This is a huge challenge for organizations because we, we want to have people 
creating original thought, but we also want them to, to understand the team concept in this, in this regard. Uh, team behavior, is, as it says here, can be studied as easily as individual behavior, and if we infer mental processes from the team's conscious experience, we get this kind of a collective consciousness built. Uh, we also start to see that there are barriers to team consciousness when uh, we fail to share information with others. Now, this, this at last aspect of sharing information is one of the more crucial ones because when we look at information sharing as a process, we have to look at communication and we have to look at terminology. What does it mean when we share information? Are we talking about the same understanding of the terms being used. That's a real key challenge in a lot of respects. So some of the things we look at with teams as far as working in normal business situations as well as abnormal situations or disruption situations is that functions of the team, they, they have a working memory. Uh, it's a long-term memory. There's a, a generally a limited attention to current situations in a lot of respects. And there's a, there's what we call perceptual filters, which is this aspect of bias that we bring to uh, the, the team in terms of how we perceive things and how we look at issues. So there's a, a whole learning curve that a team has to go through in order to be really effective. So if we begin to start to look at teams, you begin to look at how do we build this sustainability in terms of decisions and analysis and capabilities as far as what we, what we require. So you have people and what are called tools, which may be the hardware, software, uh, other aspects of the business that, that you utilize. And then you have structure, which in most organizations is relatively formal. But you have to have a common mindset. So people have to understand what we mean by the terminology that we use. Training becomes really critical in this area. And, and obviously, training is one of the most challenging areas for organizations because it's not an area where we find that there is um, a lot of time spent focusing on training because it's not going to generate profits in the mindset of a lot of people. So when we look at training, we look at how training is conducted, we look at the kind of things that we need to impart into people because they're going to come with some preconceived notions as to how things should be. And then you have to begin to look at how can I train them to think in this common mindset. Uh, we need to do, as a part of the training and as a part of the general mindset issue, recognize things like what are our weaknesses as an organization? What are, our, are, are the hazards we face? And you can break hazards down into a number of different areas. Uh, what are our opportunities as an organization? What are the threats that we face, internal, external threats, uh, threats to our what I'll call value chain, which would be our suppliers, all of our uh, customers, anything that is supporting in one way, shape, or form the organization, or as I would call it, a, a touch point for the organization. And that can include regulatory uh, bodies as far as this goes. Uh, we look at the strengths of the organization. How does the organization leverage its strengths to overcome areas of weakness? And then when we look at planning, we have to look at what are, the, what are the planning constructs? Are we developing plans specifically to meet a regulatory requirement, or are we developing plans that not only meet a regulatory requirement, but also will work within the context of our organization and other organizations that we uh, come into contact with as we do our, our business operations? Uh, this leads to a challenging area, which I uh, go back to the situational awareness issue, uh, what I call active analysis. So in a lot of respects, we have to look at continually analyzing situations that present themselves as a potential risk or a threat or a hazard to the organization. And to realize that once we recognize it, we, 
that hazard, risk, or threat, however you want to term it, actually changes. It's modified by virtue of our recognition. So now we have to constantly analyze to see what's going on and why that issue becomes uh, either a greater concern or a lesser concern. So we have to kind of focus and manage our, our focus in that area as far as the effort we put into dealing with that situation or that, that awareness. Um, and then we've got to communicate that throughout the organization. What's important? Why is it important? What are the things we need to understand? And then we need to focus on how we build what I call credibility. So if you recall many years ago, back in uh, the mid 2000s, uh, the H5N1 bird flu virus was a huge concern for organizations. Uh, everybody was trying to build pandemic plans, um, which it, it helped a lot of organizations with. I found that most of them focused on, you know, how many masks do we need? What should we do to protect our employees? All good and well, but not really understanding that the duration of a pandemic is not a week. It's more than, you know, more time than that. And so we need to understand this credibility issue. Um, you need a flexible structure that supports the long-term functional needs. Now this will tie into some perspectives in, in how we look at this. So the biggest challenge you're gonna face is getting a team to work together <clears throat> when they generally do not function every day as a team. So when we look at a situation where we enter uh, a disruption, you form a team that doesn't work together as a team on a normal basis. They may work together on a daily basis, but now we're, we're in a changed environment. So getting that team to comprehend what I'll call their crisis management roles, responsibilities, functions, and how they differ from day-to-day -day roles and responsibilities and functions is really critical. This is, again, an area where we go back to uh, the need for training. And if you look at this slide, we talk about some areas, uh, and if you look at the, my slide at the bottom right side, there's a book by a gentleman called Gary Klein, K-L-E-I-N, and it's called Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions. And what Klein has come up with is, is a look at how this, this whole process works. So he calls it team competencies, uh, team identity, and then team cognition, and this forms into what we have called a team metacognition. And if you look at the slide, there are a series of uh, questions that, that are underneath the boxes here. How good are the team members? Uh, do they help each other out? Uh, is the crisis management team heading for the same goals? Does everyone have the same picture? Uh, who's taking responsibility? All these are questions that need to be addressed before you, you uh, enter in their crisis situation or enter in, into a situation of disruption. And these can be applied on a day-to-day -day basis as, as far as the role of crisis uh, or leadership their role in educating and guiding employees. So once we started to communicate along these lines, we start to see that there's a, a greater uh, back and forth flow of information that can help with a lot of evaluations and whatnot. So if we look at teams, and I, I, I break this out into three, three areas. What I call tactical level, which is operational issues, the immediate uh, situation operational levels, which are, okay, I've got a business unit. That business unit consists of many different departments, many, many different potentially facilities, etc. How do I contain the impacts when one part of that unit, a tactical element, has a problem and prevent it from cascading through the organization? And then strategically, when I'm looking at this, how do I save the business when there's a major catastrophe? We'll get into some examples. The thing I point out with this is that the key functions listed on the right side of the slide are essentially key functions that are performed at all three levels. So someone has to be in charge, leadership. Someone has to be looking at planning. 
and that, that literally breaks out into short-term and long-term planning. Uh, someone looks at operations, what's affected, what's not affected. Logistics, which can be as simple as ordering food for lunch if there's a problem, uh, or you know, uh, supplies in some general sense. Uh, finance, who's going to pay because Believe me, insurance does not kick in immediately. So when you begin to look at finance, how do you figure out cost issues? And you begin to track those so that you can begin to figure out how you can budget against your current level of cash flow to address this issue. Administratively, you've got all kind of policies and procedures and regulatory compliance issues that have to be addressed because at some point you may be in violation of a policy or a regulatory compliance initiative. So these become critical in a lot of respects to begin to understand and address. Um, infrastructure is twofold. Organizations have an internal infrastructure, your workstation, your computers, your telephone systems, etc. You also are dependent on an external infrastructure, water, utilities, uh, gas and electric, telephone and telecommunications that you don't control. And you need to understand what happens potentially with that external infrastructure when you have a crisis or when there's a crisis that affects your organization or a disruption of some sort. Uh, this has become a real issue. So an outreach program, which is one I find to be uh, critical for organizations, is to get to know the community and begin to start to look at what do they have ex expectations of and then what are their powers as far as uh, in, in a disaster situation or a crisis situation that can affect your organization and how do you communicate that to, to your, throughout the organization. So we lead that to the final area, which is internal and external relations. So internally, we've got to be able to communicate and understand what we're saying. Externally, we need to communicate to the customers, the, the suppliers, the vendors, the what I'll call value chain, as well as the what I'll call public sector, which is the governments at various levels that are going to be involved in some way, shape, or form with our organization. Uh, as we go through a situation that is disruptive. So those communications become crucial in a lot of respects because it is an area that organizations have difficulty in addressing in a lot of ways. Um, so what I'll lead now is to look at three areas where the corporation, the corporate leadership, has an ability to influence how people understand and conceptualize risk and, and whatnot. So let's start off with a, a look at <clears throat> the, the far right side says the sphere of responsibility. Your organization as a business has a mission, vision, value statement and it's based on what are the goals and objectives. All right, so what does the business want to do? It's the same with government in a lot of respects. They also have goals and objectives. So these, these have to blend in a lot of respects. Goals and objectives for a business generally are focused on uh, increasing sales, bringing more customers on. How do we achieve these, you know, these goals and objectives? And then when we look at these areas, you have two other spheres, a sphere of interest where assets and capabilities of others can affect your courses of action. So begin to think about the sphere of interest as, as what I call the value chain, which is your customers, your suppliers, uh, all those external organizations that support you in some way, shape, or form. So your customers can affect you because they can change your business uh, organization and model. So it, this is an area we have to be aware of and communicate. Then you have your sphere of influence where you have assets and capabilities that can affect the courses of actions of others. So if you have a, a situation where you're supplying a customer with a product and there's a problem, that customer's now got a problem and you, you, you have to be able to communicate with them in order to be bring these together. These overlap in a lot of respects so that there there is this uh, need to, to bring these together in a cohesive form that allows us to continue to have good communications and understanding, especially in the area of risk and risk management. So now 
kind of switch from the general perspective to six leadership habits that I found that for organizations from the top corporate leadership through to the bottom are key because what we want to begin to do is develop these internally so that people in the organization begin to understand how to communicate upwards as well as communicate downwards through the organization so that this becomes critical when we look at these habits and again it goes back in a lot of respects to how well do we train our organization in terms of communication in terms of risk recognition in terms of uh, being able to be flexible in terms of decision making to, to be able to communicate the needs that they have in order to get things accomplished and not have things happen that suddenly don't get recognized or for fear or they don't get reported and then they, they materialize into a larger scale crisis type situation. So these ha leadership habits become really critical in order to bring the organization to this kind of, as I said, a common understanding. First thing you want to look at is how do we focus on anticipation? And this is, as the slide says, uh, leaders lack per peripheral vision. That's not to say all leaders, but this is a general statement. We get focused. We get so focused on an issue that we don't see things that are ambiguous, such as signals, that things are not as, as they should be. So when we look at issues today, we begin to start to look at the uncertainty issue. How do we anticipate? Look for the, the game-changing information. Uh, search behind the, the current boundaries of your business. Look at the things that are potentially going to impact your business that are not directly related to your business. Uh, need to build what I call wide external networks to help you scan the horizon better. Uh, those three points I think are critical as we look at the current worldwide situation, we've got some major issues that we're faced with. Um, yesterday, the, the British uh, defeated the last, uh, the, the latest attempt by uh, the Prime Minister uh, to get a, a Brexit agreement. So now, now we're faced with this tremendous uncertainty and we begin to start to look at what could be the, the collateral damage of a Brexit that doesn't have some sort of a defined staged process of leaving the European Union and you get you get tre tremendous potential confusion as a result you could take for example also uh, the issue of, of just the uh, in general the considerations of uncertainty on a number of worldwide issues. You've got situations in Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, India and Pakistan recently, uh, North Korea, uh, United States. Uh, I could go on and on and on because this, this is an area that has got a vast amount of, of potential for disruption for organizations. And it also presents for organizations a lot of need to develop what I'll call an, an intelligence gathering uh, process so that you begin to start to get information you begin to create a mosaic a picture and then you begin to look at how do I how do I manipulate that picture as new information comes in and how do I communicate that through the organization so that we have uniformity so anticipating is a, an area that is critical of organizations because they become less vulnerable to situations that are outside of uh, the norm, if you will. Uh, the second area is to, to begin to look at this, er this area, which we call critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking is always a challenge in a lot of respects because the there are a lot of management Fads. There are a lot of herd-like behaviors and beliefs. You know, you, you could 
kind of read through the slide here, it talks about all these things. Well, what I've found is that when we conduct like a, a business wargaming exercise uh, with organizations, is generally we start off, on, we'll, we'll give them a situation where there's a disruption, and I pretty much tell them, I said, look, the, the, the issue is not, will we be able to mitigate this situation? The issue is, is that you will either mitigate the situation or you won't be in business. So it's a given that the problem will eventually be solved. But when you begin to think about thinking critically, you begin to have to look at, are we so focused on a direct problem solution path that we create more problems as we go to solve the one problem that is prominent. So when we start to look at these, there's some bullets at the bottom here, reframing problems to get to the bottom of things in terms of root causes. Uh, highly critical to do that. Also challenging because root causes are generally not easily, easily determined. Um, the challenging of current beliefs and mindsets, including your own, becomes uh, critical also simply because you begin to start to say what do I actually believe this is where if you look at uh, books like Dan Kahneman's book thinking fast and slow where he goes into a discussion of our biases and these these biases that we bring to the workplace which is just you know the the, the issue of our beliefs and of how we communicate that we begin to start to recognize once we have those identified, we begin to see how they influence our current thought process. Um, this un uncovering of hypocrisy, manipulation, bias in organizational decisions, uh, it's an area that is hard to uh, deal with simply because we have to look at how are people thinking and, and we begin to start to look at are they discounting, uh, you know, the issue of hypocrisy, if you will, the bias. They're, are they discounting the situation such that we find that the situation is suddenly worse and worse and worse? And you could look at a number of things that you've seen in, in uh, crises all over the world that would require management to be more open to communications and to listen to people and understand what is being communicated to them as far as the, the degree of, of concern. Um, challenging area here, interpreting things. It, we, we're faced with a lot of ambiguity in today's world. I mentioned Brexit. Uh, you could go back and look at, at the ambiguity that we see in uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what's the price of gold going to be at the end of the day today? What's the price of oil going to be at the end of the day today? Uh, is climate change a reality or is climate change just something that we're you know, uncertain of? Do the scientists really know? Does anyone really know what Mother Nature is going to do and how climate change is going to affect us? Do we do we really understand some of the things that are going on? Uh, ambiguity in terms of uh, areas. Uh, recently, there was an article I just read uh, that uh, was talking about the the change of the magnetic north pole that we've had a slight change in magnetic north pole it caused a bunch of problems for navigation for ships at sea and whatnot uh, because gps systems had to be reset so very quickly re done as far as a response to it but in fact it was that this is still an ongoing issue what are these things and how do we deal with them so how do we how do we look at Getting a good solution without jumping to the wrong-headed conclusion towards a solution that may not address the issues that we need to we need to focus on. Uh, to be good at this, you have to do things like I said, seek patterns in multiple sources of data. So this is that creation of a mosaic, if you will. Uh, encourage others to do the same. Get them to think along the same lines. This is challenging for organizations because people perceive things differently at different levels in organizations. Uh, question the prevailing assumptions and test multiple hypotheses. This is where I look at regulatory compliance and planning that's being done to meet regulatory compliance that you suddenly find, are we out of 
the regulatory compliance spectrum and into a new area that is something that's going to change our prevailing assumptions because it's unique. So you could look at a number of, of issues that will change how we think uh, and how our plans are uh, tested, if you will, or validated. Uh, doesn't mean that your plan may be bad, doesn't mean that you've miscommunicated to your employees, and doesn't mean that corporate leadership is wrong. It means that the situation is such that we have to reinterpret things on a constant basis in order to be, uh, it, as much as we can, ahead of situations that occur. Uh, then we've got to literally make a decision what I call analysis paralysis, which is that organizations have a tendency to continually analyze, analyze, analyze without getting to the point of making a decision. Uh, so we have, to, we have to do some things in terms of decision analysis and decision uh, making as far as things go. You have to carefully frame the decision in order to get to the crux of the matter. That's critical. You have to balance what I'll call speed, rigor, quality, and agility. Uh, you're not seeking perfection, perfection here. You're really seeking the ability to have flexibility in the decision process. So I make a decision. I want to be able to manage that decision to get to where we are in a better position and people are communicated and then look at where the decision lies based on what we've done. Um, so it as we look at changing based on the decision, we have to look at the situation changing that requires us to continually move about the decision that we've made. So we kind of have to massage it as we go through. Uh, to take a stand even with incomplete information uh, and amid diverse uh, views. We really need to be focused in this area. And then we need to be able to say, this is the direction we're going. Here's how we want to get there. And these are the things that we need to we need to accomplish. So if you think about deciding and align, then the next step of aligning, if we take the situations that have occurred where we had major catastrophic events, the the, the focus of organizations has been to try to get back to a normal state of operation. The reality is that you will never be be at a normal state of operation as you were prior to the event happening, prior to the change occurring, you're going to be in a new operating normal, which changes how you how you work in a lot number of ways. So we'll take the an example from September 11, 2001, when we had the World Trade Center event, the Pentagon, etc. One of the things that the new chair, chairman of General Electric, the IMELT, who came in, uh, said that as in an interview he said i had two buildings my company insured run into with jets that had my engines on them um, that my board of directors said well in addition to all this you still have to beat your goal of building the business and and getting an 11 percent growth now what did that require uh, a lot of what we've just talked about here. He had to align and realign so that he could actually make that work and get to his corporate objectives. They were able to do that with realigning a lot of the business and things. But you have to look at these, these aspects. Understand what drives other people's agendas, uh, including what remains hidden, because people always have some back issues that they, do, they don't want to express necessarily. Uh, bring tough issues to the surface when it's, uh, even when it's uncomfortable. There are a lot of times we have to look at dealing with a lot of uncomfortable situations and how do we communicate those to the organization. So this is the, where corporate leadership really becomes um, put under a lot of stress and is in need of being able to communicate effectively. This issue of risk tolerance, I think, is one that's interesting because we, we hear a lot about it in the ISO standards. We hear a lot about it in literature today. Risk tolerance. What does risk tolerance actually mean? How much risk are you willing to tolerate? Uh, and in a lot of respects, we have to look at how much risk tolerance is directed by risk avoidance, by conservative risk 
uh, approaches, et cetera. So this ability to align an organization and align the, the individuals in the organization to understand these issues really begins to get us to begin to look at how we communicate and how we build that organizational mindset. Um, we have to learn. Uh, obviously, every time we've had a failure of any sort, there's a feedback loop. We just we, we learn from these things. The the question always has been, well, if we're learning from them, how come we keep repeating them? Uh, the unfortunate aspect is that people have a tendency to learn and then put it in a short-term uh, mindset and then not be able to relate situations similar. So, for instance, I was working with a, a large financial institution uh, and trying to describe to them the need for this organizational structuring on a strategic, operational, and tactical level with the common functionality uh, that I described earlier in the slides. And used an analogy, I used an example of uh, the, an oil spill. And they said, oh, you know, we're, we're not an oil company. We don't have that issue to deal with. I said, no, no, you're a financial institution. You spill money. And the minute they, they realized the example related to them, they, they comprehend, they said, oh, you know, you're right. Now we understand because the concepts that were used for this energy firm can be applied here, but we have to apply them within the context of our business operation. And so once they started to do that, they began to get themselves uh, focused and began to get the organization to work on a, on a kind of uh, mutual understanding at all levels. So we look at things that we need to do in terms of learning, you know, exemplify and encourage honest, rigorous uh, debriefs to extract lessons. This is really hard for organizations to do because there's a resistance. People don't want to look at areas where they uh, potentially failed or didn't do as well as they could have. They, they have a tendency to want to be you know, a little defensive in that regard. We have to overcome that. Uh, you have to shift course quickly if you realize that you're off track. A lot of times organizations will get sidetracked on issues that not that are not going to impact them in uh, the broader sense. Um, successes we ought to celebrate those and uh, look at failures that you know in a way that say not so much you know is going to cause uh, an individual or an organization or a department or whatnot to um, be ostracized, if you will, or in some respects, fired. Uh, so we want to look at that saying failure actually can be a benefit in some respects, because failures point out areas that we can improve on. So when, when I do a lot of wargaming exercises and, and scenario exercises with organizations, my, my whole focal point with them is to, to, to explain, look, your plans that you've developed are not bad they're not necessarily perfect. And by the way, the scenario will always be able to alter your plans and your concepts of how you're looking at doing things. So any scenario can be developed to defeat a plan, but it doesn't mean that the plan's bad. What we want to look at is within the plan, based on this situation, what were the failure points? And now how, how can we remedy those and learn from them? So that's a challenge in a lot of respects, but organizations who are um, able to, to deal with these situations in the broadest uh, standpoint really find themselves becoming much more, uh, how would I put it, much more able to be resilient in a lot of respects because they're looking at where is that failing based on the situation that I'm faced with? How do I communicate that so that we can remedy it quickly and so that we can overcome this issue of finger pointing and looking at you know, somebody somebody's not done their job? Where, whereas it's dictated by a situation, not necessarily dictated by the adequacy of the planning the leadership, 
the communication, etc. All these situations will have within them areas of failure and leadership one of the critical aspects of corporate leadership here is to overcome those fairly rapidly and to get people to understand things are not necessarily perfect, but they're moving towards a, a, a quick recovery on a lot of respects. So this last slide here, when I look at this, I thought it was an interesting slide to, to put in because there is a lot of, um, I put it, there's a lot of truth, and there's also an element of deception. And I, and I don't mean it being that they're trying to deceive, but that the deception comes in in thinking the wrong way. So as the slide says, when things go wrong, you must have a business continuity plan in place. And then on the right side, you can see that there are a number of uh, statistics and a and, uh, number of things that are written here. 50% of businesses go out of business after a major dis disruption. I, I would ask you to challenge that as a statement because those that 50% of businesses that go out of business uh, due to a disruption, what if they all had a plan? And they still went out of business. The fact is, most businesses, if they survive the first year in business, continue in business for a longer period of time. But the failure rate of business is, is not predicated on having a plan or not having a plan. So the statistic there, and I had a colleague that uh, looked at this and tried to find the source on this and basically came up with a conclusion that someone had pretty much figured out that Oh, well, it just sounds like a good number. So that is a challengeable perspective. Half of businesses go out of business because they didn't have a plan? No. I, I think it's because they failed to meet their goals and objectives, which is a whole different aspect than having a continuity plan. Uh, if you look at the estimated cost, $360 billion, 65% of it is caused by earthquake, tsunami. Uh, U.S. lost more than $40 billion. The world, Asia, $250 billion, $40 billion. Floods in Thailand, $210 billion. Yeah. These are all dramatic numbers, and they, they mean something, but they don't necessarily mean that having a plan is going to prevent them from happening. A plan will not prevent an earthquake. A plan will not prevent a tsunami. A plan will not prevent workplace violence. A plan will not prevent explosions, fires, etc. So when we look at these potential disasters that we are faced with, the ability to communicate from a corporate leadership uh, standpoint is to, to really have a focus on putting in place a mindset that allows us to utilize planning and planning concepts that give us flexibility, that be, make us more resilient, make us quicker to be able to recognize situations and to be able to respond to those situations. So this issue of, of planning doesn't necessarily guarantee success. Think of how many businesses build a strategic plan. It says, this is where we want to go, our corporate goals and objectives. How do we get there? What do we do? How do we, how do we deal with achieving these things? Or we'll recognize that a lot of things happen during the course of achieving those, a lot of disruption. So those are the things that I think we, we need to begin to understand. And the leadership role, as far as a corporation, has to be strong. They can't divorce themselves away from the organization. They have to become part of the process of building this, this capability. So I'll conclude um, with – hang on. There, okay. I'll conclude by turn, turning this over back to our uh, moderator. We've got about 15 minutes left on the uh, time frame here, so we'll open it up to questions and whatnot, and let uh, 
let you ask and see what we can answer. Thank you, Gary, for this uh, informing and great presentation. I want to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 31000 Introduction Foundation Risk Manager, Lead Risk Manager, and also the Transition Course. A certification in the above mentioned courses uh, will put, portray your dedication in implementing and managing risk management processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be part of a recognized uh, uh, professional network. Now, we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees regarding today's topic. So, the first question is, uh, how do you ensure that you have an effective continuity team? I, I think there's a number of ways. And, and my top three would be that you have a, an effective continuity team when you train them and when you exercise them. Those are, those are two areas right there that are critical. The better trained they are to work as a, as, as a team in a disruptive situation, the easier it is for them to overcome the transition process of going from day-to-day -to, -day to suddenly a different structure uh, and operation, on operations that are on a, a more critical path, if you will. So two areas, training and drills and exercises, are critical. Uh, effective drills and exercises need to be broken down into a number of different areas, uh, especially when we look at the, the, what I'll call the tabletop exercise. Getting people to rethink and reframe situations, to begin to see that there, that there are solutions to the problem, but also that as they go along this path, of finding solutions, they may create new problems as a result, and they need to understand the cascading effects. So uh, an example, I had a, uh, an organization that was uh, planning back in the day for the pandemic, and they wanted to, to order masks and all these other things. And we did a, a simple exercise where we took them through, and, and I brought up the, the historical perspective that pandemics generally last, and if you look at the internet and Wikipedia and other areas, you'll find that pandemics in history last 500 to 800 days. So now, and obviously, yes, people can argue they come in waves and whatnot, but generally no one can tell you when a wave starts and when a wave doesn't start. So the, the company wanted to do something. They were, they were, they were, we need to do, we need to do. So they wanted to order masks. And I said, well, how many masks and for how long? Uh, the question then became one of a discussion. Uh, you've got 14,000 employees, not including contractors who work there. So if you just get them for your employees, how long, how long and how many? And then it was the, well, um, we don't know. I said, great, now we're going to sit down. I said, let's take worst case scenario. Pandemic lasts 800 days. You now have 14,000 employees. To do the, you can do the math. It comes out somewhere around 12 million masks because they're only used once and you have to throw them away. Um, and you start to, to suddenly see that there's a mind shift that changes and it because the CEO of the company says, well, how much will that cost? Is it at the current prices? About a quarter of a billion dollars, which sent a shockwave through the organization. And then somebody asked about, well, what about the storage facilities that we'd have to have to house all that and the distribution and all the other things? And then, as I explained to them, I said, and because of the government, they have this power called eminent domain, they can come in and take all those for the greater good of the community. At that point, they said, okay, what can we do to change or help us protect our people, but yet not have to incur costs and be, not be able to use use the uh, you know the materials. So we changed some policies and procedures. We changed the the way they did some of the maintenance. We got some antibacterial soaps. We got some other things that were just part of the part of the, the maintenance budget for the organization. Uh, and that change reflected a whole different perspective. We taught people uh, things like how to, how to 
cover their costs, how, you know, not to come to work if you're sick. Uh, we actually changed some of the human resources policies as a result. But had they gone along that path of getting masks, they, they might have been uh, legally liable in so many different ways that they weren't just unaware of. What if you don't get enough? Well, you knew or should have known, and and that would be a legal liability, et cetera, et cetera. So the the, the challenge is to be a able to, to train and to, to exercise and to get people on this kind of a thought process that makes them uh, a little bit more flexible and a little bit more uh, accepting of the communication flow. Okay, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, so we'll stick to the continuity team. Uh, do you consider, uh, the next question, do you consider that the continuity team should have a single and final decision person, or how should the team actually function in order to take the good decision and avoid the differences of opinion? Uh, I, think, I think that at all three levels, that I discussed, the, the tactical, operational, and strategic, you have to have strong leadership, and you have to have a, a single, if you will, a single point, a, a, a leader, what we would call at the tactical level an incident commander, who makes the decisions at that point. Now, at the next level, the operational level, they have to understand why the decisions are being made, and then be able to support those, but they also have a role in decision making because now they have to look at how do I prevent that incident from cascading throughout my business units. And then when you get to the strategic level, again, this all is from a communications going upward. They have to understand the situation. They have to minimize their, their desire, if you will, to micromanage. And they have to begin to look at a uh, a decision-making focus that is less internally focused or downward focused and more externally focused. How do I explain to my customers, to my, my suppliers, to the vendors, all these organizations that are out there, government, etc., how do I explain to them so that their fears are abated and that and that they they understand that that we're working through this process and that they're not going to be abandoned. Uh, a good example would be uh, a company that I worked with had uh, a facility that produced uh, uh, dog food, you know, pet products um, in Missouri and the, the, the facility was hit by the, uh, a, a tornado that devastated it. One of their big clients, which is uh, a major client of theirs, uh, basically was on the phone very quickly with them afterwards and saying, okay, we're glad that no one was injured in, in this. Uh, we understand you've had you know, disruption to your facility. Uh, when can you get our, our product to us? And by the way, if you don't do it pretty quickly, we're going to go to somebody else. And, and so the, the pressure was put on, and, the, and the, again, the customer said, we know you have other facilities that can do this, so figure it out. So what this company had to really quickly do was go in and make up the loss production at other facilities in order to keep the customer happy. Um, the customer was, uh, how would I put it? They were demanding but fair in how they, how they approached this because they actually facilitated a lot. They said, we'll help you with transportation and other things because that's one of the things we, we have uh, available. But you have an obligation, you have to figure out how to meet it. So they shifted around a lot of production in order to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's that's where this leadership aspect comes in because suddenly you're going to f unaffected facilities saying, you've got to do change and we got to, we got to do this differently. And they have to do a quick turn to change their operation around. So it's this ability to have flexibility and, and to be responsive, but again, at those three levels, each has a slightly different focus. The critical element is the ability to communicate and have people understand what it is you're saying. 
So the terminology issue becomes crucial. Thank you, Gary. Uh, actually, we're getting a lot of questions for this very interactive section, session. <laughs> uh, so another interesting question is, how about changing roles in exercise scenarios, like having the CEO working as cleaning service and vice versa? Uh, so to make everybody aware of the importance of all within of all processes within the organization. I, I think that's a, an admirable uh, thing to aspire to. Uh, it also gives the, it gives the organization an opportunity to get a little bit more of a comprehension. I, I, again, I, I've seen it where we have had organizations that have uh, done this and they've they've worked their way through processes. If again, you go to the the slide I had on the tactical, operational, and strategic. When you're at the strategic level and you're sitting in an office far removed from the incident and you're listening to somebody who's there on the incident scene, you don't want to try to tell them what to do. And you want to have, have a strong leadership at the incident area, the, the, the event area, if you will, that's, that pushes back on suggestions from leadership in that regard and tells them exactly you know why don't you go do this versus telling me what to do here because I'm I'm in the situation you're far removed from it um, I agree that that this ability to kind of bring them down uh, to change roles is really uh, valuable in a lot of respects because it allows them to uh, get an appreciation for the kind of things that that the people are facing in those roles. Now, that that being said, you have to understand also that there's a certain amount of bias that comes with these. As you go higher up in an organization, people who are generally at the corporate levels higher up in the organization have, in some respects, they've come up through the ranks. So they have that perspective. And what the problem they face is, is that they are not there in the ranks currently. They understand it from when they were there, and it's getting them to understand how it is now, not how it was. You know, and so that that's a real challenge. But I think that's a great uh, a great suggestion is is bringing them in and having them do. Uh, the other aspect is you know, generally we try to have what three levels. You have a primary position holder, an alternate, and then a second alternate. Uh, the reality, is, and this is always a challenge, is that when you're doing an exercise, everyone wants all the primary p position holders to be there. Well, one of the things I, I like to throw in is is to say, no, your primary position holders, you, you know, what's your what's your travel schedule? Where are you at? What are you doing here, here, and here? You're out of town. Now you you can observe and watch the alternates and have this mix. You mix mix the uh, population, if you will, to put people who are suddenly uh, not getting exercised all that often into a situation where they're being exercised, and then you get the people who are the primary saying, well, that's not how I would think, or that's not how I would do. So it's a it's this dialogue that begins to develop. Kind of a long answer, but... Okay, thank you, Gary. And now, two quick questions before we conclude the presentation. The first question is, if management has a high focus on production, who in the organization can aid them in developing a greater level of awareness in relation to risk, hazards, and disasters? I think that's a, a crucial area, and I think that if the organization has a risk management function, that the risk management function has to look at operational, financial, and uh, other, uh, what I'll call other risks. That, that could be geopolitical risks, that can be uh, talent risks, all these other things that, that are, are pre presenting themselves as risk issues. If they don't have a risk management position, uh, I think it's incumbent upon the people at the tactical level and operational level to begin to point out some of the, the threats that, that are presented and begin to communicate those upwards so that the people who are in decision making at the senior levels uh, get a better appreciation for the exposures that they may have 
with regards to you know the the risk issues that they face. Okay, now to conclude the presentation, uh, one another short question: How do you communicate risk management to employees when there is no management commitment and top management seems not to understand the concept of risk management and stakeholders analysis? Um, I guess that that it, it's I, what do you put it? That's very difficult in terms of how do you how you communicate that. Um, the process of maybe going through some case studies to show similar situations, getting management to buy in is so crucial to the success of any risk management, business continuity, disaster plan, et cetera, because if management doesn't buy into the concept, uh, all your efforts will be wasted. And you can look at trying to explain them regulatory compliance and all the other things they have to understand that there is a a personal impact to them if something happens you know it, it, they can't be so insulated from the business that they don't see the risks and they and they they cannot be allowed to um, uh, how would they put it discount risks so they have they have to be they have to be brought to a level of awareness, and I think that that's a real challenge. Uh, getting them to participate, or even as observers of an exercise, uh, whether it's a tabletop or a you know an actual full fledged exercise, uh, is something that is extremely challenging. The other thing is that you have to understand or you have to look at the corporate culture and find out from the cultural standpoint uh, and this this is an area I find challenging because culture is so broad-based you have corporate culture you have then a national cultures you have you know, all these things where you see that the culture uh, affects how they how they do decision making and you know in places like Asia and the Middle East and in other areas uh, for an underling to bring up an issue uh, is a challenge because how do I do it without embarrassing the, the the boss and how do I make the boss understand the criticality of it uh, so so a lot of these things become uh, challenges to deal with and I, I would tell you that in a lot of respects having an outside consultant come in and explain uh, some of these is a way to overcome the issue of how do I internally communicate this without causing problems. Thank you Gary uh, again yep. for this great session always a pleasure having you back and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. For more information about PECB or upcoming webinars, please visit www.pecb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.